show. Joe Rowland. Good to see you. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Welcome, sir. The, uh... Not bad for a guy who wrote on Beauty and the Beast, huh? <laughs> Beauty and the Beast, Twilight Zone. That's right. Even episodes of Max Headroom that were never filmed. So That's I have incredible. a very checkered past. It's a. Uh, <laughs> when did you get the sense that that this was really turning into something big? Uh, well, you know, it was the second book. Uh, Clash of Kings was the first one to make the New York Times bestseller list. I was on uh, number 13 for, for one week mm -hmm. and uh, then gone again. But that was still very exciting for me. It was the first time I'd ever made any of the bestseller lists. Uh, but it's just built from there. I mean, every every book does better than the one before. And uh, some of the things that have been happening over the last few years are pretty, pretty astonishing. You know, the Time 100 list. Uh, Emmy Award nominations, um, the success of the latest book, Dance with Dragons, I mean, which is uh, debuted at number one on the Times list and is still on the Times list 30 right. weeks later, um, is, is pretty astonishing to me every time I think about it. And the popularity of the show, I mean, I, I now have two completely different audiences. Uh, the, those who have been with me all along, who've been reading the book since the first one came out in 1996, and the people who come to the books through the show and uh, experience first the HBO series and now have picked up the books and are starting to read them. Are they different fans? Are there, are, can you see trends in both groups of people that are really unique? They're certainly different in their reactions to the, to the TV series. Uh, we see that very clearly, and David Benioff and D.B. Weiss, who are, who are working on the series, uh, have a very difficult job there because the, the people who, who have read the books first and, and love the books are, are seeing the series through the prism of the books, and they, they tend to react and sometimes, I think, overreact to any deviation from the books, you know, and some of them will just go create, my God, they made his hair dark, his hair was red in the books, how, how, uh, they've ruined it, they, I can't watch it anymore, his hair was supposed to be red. Um, but don't they give you grief too, though, when you get something wrong in the books? Because they seem to know more about the universe than you do in some respects. Yeah, the, my, my, I have uh, hardcore fans who notice any mistake I make, and uh, <laughs> they, they will point it out to me. And, and I do make mistakes in the books. All long before the TV series, I was, I was screwing up on certain things. I mean, the, the character of Renly, for example, is, is described initially with, with blue eyes, and then later I say he has green eyes that match his armor, and I got like 50 letters about that. You know, and so when I wrote the second book, I said, Renly, who has blue-green eyes that seem, <laughs> seem to change <laughs> according to what he's wearing, uh, you know, so, uh, you know. And I have, my, I also famously have a horse that changes sex between books. Right. Who, who, who was a, a stallion in one book and then a mare in the next book, or, but or speaks, vice versa. Maybe it speaks I, I have to a how you write, track right? of, of horse sexes. Uh, <laughs> so you're, you're, unlike Tolkien, you, you don't approach this like architecture. You don't have this entire, like all the details and manuals and glossaries laid out then. No, I have, I have some of that, but less, much less than you would think. Uh, it's, it's a much more organic process. I've often said that, uh, that writers are of two types. Uh, there, there is the architect, which is one type, and the architect, as, as with designing a building, lays out the entire novel ahead of time. He knows how many rooms there will be and what the roof will be made of and how high it will be and where the plumbing will run and where the electrical outlets will be in each room and all of that stuff before he drives the first nail. Everything is there in the blueprint. And then there's the gardener who, like, digs a hole in the ground and puts in a seed and waters it with his blood, and he sees what comes up. Um, now, the gardener knows certain things. It's, he's not completely ignorant. He knows whether he planted an oak tree or an ear of corn or a cauliflower. So he, he, he has some idea of the shape, but a lot of it depends on the wind and the weather and, and uh, how much blood he gives it and so forth. So I think all writers are... No one is purely an architect. No one is purely a gardener in terms of writers. But many writers tend to one side or the other, and I'm very much more a, a gardener, mm -hmm. as indeed was was Tolkien. I mean, for for all his the architecture he did on like the Cimmerillion, which he began before World War One, um, he he was 
He started Lord of the Rings thinking he was writing a sequel to The Hobbit, and it would be another children's book about the, you know, the adventures of, of a couple hobbits stealing something. And it obviously grew into something much larger than he ever expected. And, uh, you know, he later said the tale grew in the telling, and that's a line I've often had uh, cause to quote myself, because my tale has grown in the telling <laughs> many, many times. Is it... Is it you know, our culture really re identifies with how TV series end. We remember it works out beautifully in the way that Newhart ended. It was bizarre in the way that either The Sopranos or Lost ended. When you're writing a series and you know you have a couple of books left, do you do you ever struggle with what? How do you do right by the series? How do you end this properly? Is the, do you already have that stuff figured out? I, I have the broad strokes figured out. Um, you know, I've, I've often used the analogy of a journey. Like if, if uh, you were going from uh, Toronto here down to uh, Los Angeles, uh, you would probably look at a map ahead of time and say, well, how, how am I going to drive to Los Angeles? And well, I'll, I'll take this road and I'll go through Chicago and then I'll head south. And you know, you know your ultimate destination and you know the principal roads that you're going to take to get you to the ultimate destination. But you don't know where you're going to stop for lunch on the first day. You don't know where you might get a flat tire or pick up an interesting hitchhiker or where there's going to be a huge construction project that's going to force you to go three miles out of your way. So those are the adventures that you, you find on the course of the journey. And uh, for me as a writer, I find things during the course of writing uh, that are of interest to me. And that that's really what the fun in the writing for me is. It's not just if you planned it all out ahead of time and we're just typing the words. Uh, I think it would be sort of a soul deadening exercise. I, I enjoy having the adventure of the journey and what what will happen today. Well, you know, and you also uh, you, you get to explore really complex morality in these in these stories. And a great fantasy should really be about talking about the world in a, in, in a bigger sense. You're doing that, aren't you, in this stuff? Yeah, well, I'm certainly trying to do that. Yeah, that's that's always been one of my goals. Um, I, I mean, I love fantasy. I grew up reading science fiction. I grew up reading fantasy. I love Tolkien. Uh, he, I read him when I was in junior high school. He had a profound effect on me. He's the, the father of all modern fantasy. We all are working in the, the shadow of the great mountain that is Lord of the Rings. Um, but that being said, Tolkien did certain things that, that are different than what I would do. And in the hands of some of the Tolkien imitators, those things have become cliches that I think have, have ultimately harmed the, the genre and made, it, made people think that it's uh, you know, entertainment for children or for particularly slow adults. Um, <laughs> And, and all this stuff about uh, the Dark Lord is rising in the north and, you know, the, the good guys have to get together to fight him. Guys in, uh, handsome guys in white cloaks fighting really ugly guys who dress all in black. Uh, you know, the battle between good and evil, that's fine. I, the battle between good and evil is a universal theme, not only for fantasy, but for any fiction. Right. But my opinion has always been that the battle between good and evil is fought within the individual human heart. All of us have the capacity for good. All of us have the capacity for evil. The same people have the capacity for doing that on different days. You, you read about war heroes who save their whole platoon and are incredibly brave, and then they go home and they beat up their wives, or they become an alcoholic, or they become a thief and things like that. How do you reconcile that? Well. They're human beings, uh, and human beings are endlessly fascinating to me. And the fact that we we do have good and evil in us, that we can, we can be angels or we can be monsters, and how do we make these choices? How do we go through life? And that's the stuff I love to to wrestle with. You were a conscientious objector. Uh, I was yes Vietnam? During, during Vietnam. What was yeah. that process like? I mean, you you would have seen firsthand the complexity of humanity right there. Um, I did, actually, it was surprisingly easy for me. Uh, oddly enough, uh, I know a lot of guys who tried to get CO status during Vietnam and who were refused it. Um, you know, you, you probably know some of them because many of them became Canadians. Yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> when they we were, welcome them. When they were turned down, yes. Um, you know, back then it was said that, uh, that most draft boards, and all the draft boards were local, they would not give you a CO status if you objected to Vietnam. They would only give it to you if you were a complete pacifist and objected to all wars. 
and I was not a complete pacifist. You know, the, the, the big question they would always ask you is, would you, would you have fought in World War II against the Nazis? Well, yes, I would have fought in World War II against the Nazis, because, uh, uh, but the Viet Cong were not the Nazis, and uh, I didn't think America had any business in Vietnam, and, and so forth. So I was objecting to that particular war, and everyone told me, well, you'll never get the CO status. Um, but oddly enough, I did get the CO status, and relatively easily. And I learned later that my draft board was so conservative that they felt well, anyone who wanted the CO status should have it, because then he'll be branded forever as a yellow-bellied coward and a traitor, and he'll, <laughs> his life will be ruined, and that would be enough punishment for him. So, uh, <laughs> Thank God for that. So they ruined my life, and uh, <laughs> there I am. Uh, but no, so I and I did two years uh, alternate service right. uh, in, in Vista Volunteer, working uh, in legal assistance in Chicago. Um, you know, using my journalism background, and I, they mostly had me doing public relations and publicizing the cases they were taking. But it was an interesting experience. Uh, I got to got to see a lot of stuff, did and I sure? still think the Vietnam War was a terrible mistake for America. But I still would have fought against the Nazis. Yeah. <laughs> Do you work that kind of political uh, uh, belief system into the work? Into the work? Well, I, I don't do it deliberately. I mean, I'm not writing uh, an allegory uh, like Tolkien, who you know was sometimes accused that Lord of the Rings was an allegory of World War II, uh, which he always reacted to angrily because he didn't he didn't believe in that. And either either do I. If I want to write about World War II or about Vietnam, I'll write about World War II about or about Vietnam. Um, nonetheless, my my beliefs certainly permeate uh, some of. Song of Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones. Uh, part of it being my belief about war and violence, uh, which also enters, I mean, things like Beauty and the Beast and, and my television work and, and all that. You know, working in network television, there's a, we were under constant pressure on a show like Beauty and the Beast to have more action. We, we had, you know, in the view of the network, we had too many women watching the show and not enough men. We had to get more men. How do you get more men? You have more action. Action is network speak for violence, right. <laughs> but bloodless violence. You know, we weren't allowed. Vincent was actually going out and uh, ripping people apart with his claws. He was disemboweling these people and slashing their throats open. But we weren't allowed to show a drop of blood, right? <laughs> because that would disturb people. That would be violence. We can't show violence on television, but we should show lots of action. You right. know, and you know, we love like car chases and things like that. Well, if you've ever been in a car that's wrecked. It's a horrible, traumatic <laughs> experience. There's, you know, disorienting, and the metal is screaming and clashing, and people sometimes die very painfully and bloodily. And, and yet we watch this for this bloodless entertainment of, of cars flipping and turning. And it's the same way, I think, in fantasy. War is so central to fantasy so much of, of, of high fantasy, and yet it's these bloodless wars where the heroes are killing unending armies of orcs and the heroes themselves are not themselves ever being killed. Um, you kill everybody all the time, man. <laughs> <laughs> you fall in love with a character and they're dead. <laughs> it's, it's true. I mean, I'm guilty of killing people. But, uh, you know, I think if, you, if you're going to write about the war and violence, then show the cost. Show how ugly it is. Show... Show, show both sides of it. There's also, I mean, and on the other side, which sometimes get me, gets me in trouble from the other side of the political spectrum, is the glory of war, uh, which we, those of us who are, who are opposed to war and would rather not have war, tend to forget about or try to pretend it doesn't exist. But if you read the ancient historical sources, people were always talking about the glory of war, the banners that stirred the heart, the banners in the wind and in medieval days, the night, you know, medieval ages, everybody, everything was brown, you know, the, the clothes were brown, the, the ground was brown, the, it was a brown centuries. But the knights would come out in colors. They were the only people rich enough to afford dyed clothing, and they'd be in their blues and their crimsons and their yellows. They must have seemed glorious to the peasants who were coming in, in their metal suits and going into combat. But then after the battle was finished, there would be like severed limbs in everywhere and pools of blood. You, you read descriptions of the Hastings battlefield after the Battle of Hastings were fought. And yeah, there literally were like leg streams of blood and, and giant pools of blood. There's a lot of blood in a human being. And when you're fighting with these sharp swords and hacking off limbs and, you know, hacking people in the middle of the head, it's not a bloodless exercise. It's going to come out. And yeah, it's going to come out. And uh, I think if you're going to write, 
about that period, then you should reflect honestly what it's about and capture both sides of that. The, you know, whatever emotional stirring we feel when we see the banner proudly flying in the wind and we hear the bugles charge and the drums are beating and the armies surge forward, but also the aftermath. A big part of that conversation in the history of war is directly tied to religion, and there is a school of thought which suggests once a Catholic, always a Catholic, regardless of how lapsed you are. <laughs> yes, uh, I'm pretty lapsed. Yeah, pretty lapsed? <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty lapsed, yeah. But there's lots of ritual in that as well, and there's a lot of ritual in your work. Is, 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 does some of that sort of feed in? Well, well certainly. I mean, I, I think, you know, your, your experiences as a child will, will shape who you are, and you, no matter how much your intellectual will, will reject them, you... you can't ever completely escape them you know I mean even though I, I stopped going to church when I was in college you know which is now like 50 years ago or so and have been a lapsed Catholic since you know when I still like I, I read about the wars of religion or something it's like I'm almost rooting for the Catholics because <laughs> I'm on team Catholic uh, against you know team Puritan or something yeah. like that 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 old loyalty still uh, still somehow kicks in nice. and I wish like Notre Dame would do good again in football so <laughs> well, listen, for a guy who, who, who has trouble writing apparently when your team loses you won the Super Bowl so I should expect we three did. books yes, in a million yes. times. Go uh, Giants! <laughs> stick around we're going to talk to George a little bit more and also so much of his success is based on you as the fans so we're going to do uh, the fans more with George R. R. Martin right after this. see the Simpsons with the parody. We've talked about it in, in the break. You know, Chuck, Big Bang Theory, Castle. A lot of people. Right. I've right. done these shout-outs to Game of Thrones. It's it's, uh, cool. it, it's very cool. You have this really interesting relationship with your fans in that you, you, you let them in your life. You let them know what you're doing. But And I've seen fans be angry at writers before, but I have never seen people get as angry as I get at you because you take your time. <laughs> yeah. To they get pissed off at you if you do a renovation in your house. <laughs> They have, yes. I, I should be, I should be entirely devoted to uh, to writing this uh, this one series of books that they particularly like. How do you feel about it? Uh, you know, it, it it irritates me. I mean, I think we all would like to be loved universally and have everybody think we're the greatest things on sliced bread. Um, and I try to put it in proportion, and you know, I think 99% of my fans are fabulous, and I get far more supportive letters saying, "Take as long as you want." You know, we love your work. The books are great. Thank you, thank you. Um, but uh, the the occasional negative letter that comes in, even though it's vastly outnumbered by the good ones, can be irritating. And the the trolls who you know, I. I mean, I have to moderate my, my blog now, which I never had to do in the early days, but it, right. it just reached a stage where if I didn't have it moderated and cut things, it would just be, it would just be overwhelmed. And it wouldn't be just, uh, just me. I mean, someone would post a, a negative message, an attacking message on the blog, and then like three or four of my fans would, uh, the, the fans on the f side of light and goodness. <laughs> would come rushing to my defense and then the trolls would start attacking them and then suddenly there would be hundreds of messages of the fans fighting with each other even without me posting it's one thing. all in this. They know how to do it because it's all in this. Yes. Um, the, there's one thing that's also really interesting about your books and notice is that you write women really well. You write them really different. Uh, I know your, your wife is obviously a strong influence in yes. your life. Uh, where does that come from? You know, I've, I've always... I've always considered women to be people. Obviously, you know. I, you know, one of the hardest things as a as a writer is to is to write someone who's not yourself. I mean, the easiest 
fictional character create is one who's exactly like yourself. So right. when I'm writing, uh, and I have characters who are quite like me in my Wildcard series, the great and powerful turtle, Tommy Tudbury, is, is practically me without the, the major <laughs> telekinetic superpower, which I wished I'd had as a kid, but I didn't ever actually develop. But he, he lives where I live in Bayonne, New Jersey. He, he lives in the actual project that I live in. The view out his front window was the view out my front window. So I've really mined my, uh, my biography to create the uh, great and powerful turtle. But when you're writing fantasy, when, I've never, obviously, I've never been a prince. I've never been a king. I, I've never murdered anyone. Um, I've never been a dwarf. I've never been an 11-year-old girl. So, you know, the question is, how do you write these characters? Well, there's a certain amount of stuff that you have to get uh, by doing research. You have to talk to people who actually have had these experiences. Like when, when Bran was crippled by his fall, uh, I had a, a couple correspondences with, with readers of mine who were uh, paraplegic and uh, had, had no use of their legs and, you know, described to me some of the consequences, some of the things I might not have thought of and made suggestions to me of how better to write that. And I certainly took that sort of stuff into, into account. Mm -hmm. But then the main thing is, is empathy and saying, well, okay, how would I feel? Because the character is still a person. There's a certain basis of common humanity. And that's true when writing about women or writing about a dwarf or, or writing about any of this. You have to start with the basis. They're more like me than they are unlike me. Right. They, they have some special condition that they have a, a different set of genitals than I do, but they still, it's still the same old story, a fight for love and glory, right? right. We, all, we all want kind of the same things out of life, and that humanity can motivate characters and, and make them real, and that's what I try to remember at all times. All right, now, I don't want to do a spoiler thing here, but have you given any thought to this R plus L equals J theory about Snow's <laughs> um, uh, bloodline? I, I, I make no comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> no comments about Jon Snow's mummy. I uh, have to keep reading the books for that. Very good. Uh, season one of Game of Thrones is available. It's on Blu-ray and DVD. It's, it's now, but you have to cram it all in because season two of Game of Thrones appears April 1st on HBO Canada. And you should also see behind the scenes uh, Game of Thrones stuff at the Tip uh, Bell Lightbox in Toronto. A lot of cool stuff. Yeah, it's an amazing exhibit that they have down there. Absolutely. Go down to Lightbox and you can check it out. And of course, you can get all the books uh, as well. Good to see you, man. Thank you so Great. much for coming. See you. Martin, everybody. We'll be right back. I'm just going to do.